Good evening. On February 11, 2013, the world was stunned by the resignation of Pope Benedict XVI, otherwise known as Cardinal Ratzinger, or for the purposes of this discussion, just Ratzinger for short. This was the first papal resignation since Gregory XII in 1415. While ostensibly the presumed and often repeated reason for the surprise resignation was his advanced age and weakness of body, Never before in over 500 years had these reasons justified the almost unprecedented act of abdication. In the intervening years from 2013 to his death on the last day of 2022, Ratzinger continued to reside in the papal state, donning the white papal vestments, imparting his apostolic blessing, sometimes something that is reserved exclusively for popes, and even referring to himself as Pope, albeit Pope Emeritus, a phrase also without precedent. Ratzinger's apparent successor, Jorge Bergoglio, has since 2013 systematically worked to erase, overturn, and even destroy whatever legacy Ratzinger would have liked to have left, particularly when it comes to the matters of traditionalism and the Latin mass. He seems to be supercharged with the leftist globalist energy, frantically in these last years, hurling the establishment church, for lack of a better word, into the hands of the World Economic Forum and J.P. Morgan Chase, all while autocratically ruling like a tyrant even while simulating an imagined course of synodality. This fact has obviously helped fuel speculation that Francis is, in fact, an anti-pope. Many who have been disgusted and horrified by the brazen anti-Catholic instincts of Bergoglio were able to take refuge in the other man in white, who operated quietly in the background for almost nine years, seeming to counter-signal the other man in white, who was wrecking the church. What began as a small fringe group of academics and skeptics today has become a huge portion of faithful Catholics today. To wit, just last month, out of more than 8,000 respondents to Dr. Taylor Marshall's Twitter poll, almost half believe Bergoglio to be an anti-pope. And these aren't all classical Pius XII Sedevi contests, those traditionalists who believe that there has been an interregnum since before the so-called Second Vatican Council. Many of the respondents to this poll agree with Dr. Ed Maza, who joins RTF for the first time, who is an early proponent of the theory that Ratzinger never validly resigned. Dr. Maza, thank you so much for joining us. Dr. Edmund J. Maza teaches live, online, and recorded video courses in church and world history at edmundmaza.com. Maza is the author of The Third Secret of Fatima and the Sedonal Church, Volume 1, Pope Benedict's Resignation, as well as The Scholastics and the Jews, Coexistence, Conversion, and the Medieval Origins of Tolerance from Angelico Press. He is former a full-time professor of history at Azusa Pacific University, where he taught for 14 years. Dr. Maza has guest appeared on multiple times on Dr. Taylor Marshall, Timothy Gordon's Rules for Retrogrades, The Meaning of Catholic, The John Henry Weston Show, uh, The Terry and Jesse Show, and The Anne Barnhart Podcast. On the contrary, however, the majority of the respondents to the, to the um, Taylor Marshall Twitter poll actually do believe that, in fact, Francis is the Pope. The man who has instigated this discussion is Matt Gaspers, who is no stranger of the RTF podcast, and is the managing editor of Catholic Family News a monthly journal and online media apostolate devoted to promoting and defending the traditional Catholic faith. He was asked by John Venari, longtime editor of CFN and stalwart defender of the faith, to carry on CFN's important work before Mr. Venari's passing. In addition to writing for CFN, Mr. Gasper's articles have been published by the Fatima Center, 1 Peter 5, and LifeSite News. He has spoken at conferences hosted by CFN and the Fatima Center, as well as the Catholic Identity Conference, and has appeared multiple times on the Dr. Taylor Marshall podcast, as well as the Don John Henry Weston show and the One Peter Five podcast. Sounds like the three of us all have the same stomping grounds, gentlemen. In 2018, uh, Gaspers traveled to Rome to cover the Youth Synod. He and his wife, together with their children, reside in Colorado. Thank you so much for joining us, Matt. All right. Thank you. Dr. Maza, I go to you first. Uh, what we'll do here is we'll, each of you will give a 10-minute opening statement to make your case. There are some visual aids that you've sent me. If you want me to refer to those, I'm in the background ready to give those to you. 
But otherwise, Dr. Maza, the floor is. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Matt. In 2013, Pope Benedict vacated the chair of Peter for a successor. But in a move unprecedented in the church's 2000 year history, instead of returning to Bishop Ratzinger, he declared himself Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI. He mandated he continue to be called His Holiness. He continued to wear papal white, reside in the Vatican, and give papal blessings in his own name. Obviously, he did not completely renounce that status first bestowed on him on April 19, 2005. Quote, from that moment on, I was engaged always and forever by the Lord. Anyone who accepts the Petrine ministry belongs always and completely to everyone, to the whole church. My decision to renounce the active exercise of the ministry does not revoke this. I no longer carry the power of the office for the government of the church, but in the service of prayer, I remain, so to speak, in the precincts of St. Peter." Unquote. Why resign the active exercise of the ministry? Why not the exercise of the ministry, period? As Robert Moynihan, editor of Inside the Vatican Magazine, wrote, quote, if Benedict's words of this morning mean anything, they mean that the sea is not totally vacant, unquote. Actually, Benedict's words from 1966 may shed light on those of 2013, quote, the ministry of the bishop is not an externally assigned administrative power, but is itself sacramentally based. The ruling of the church and its spiritual mystery are inseparable, unquote. Or his words of empathy in 1982 for the orthodox critique of a legalistic papacy. Quote, the sacramental system seems choked by this new concept of law. For Catholics, the papacy is not a sacrament. It is only a juridical institution. But this juridical institution has set itself above the sacramental order, unquote. Or as Ratzinger maintains, quote, the most crucial event in the development of the Latin West was the increasing distinction between sacrament and jurisdiction, between liturgy and administration as such, the separation of office as jurisdiction from office as right, unquote. In 2013, Ratzinger may have relinquished the office as jurisdiction or administration, but it is obvious that he kept the passive office as right or sacrament. As Catholic Family News contributor Chris Ferrara wrote then, quote, I do not mean to suggest that Benedict is implying that he will, in some legal or juridical sense, remain Pope. But there is an implication here of some kind of ontological papal residuum, so to speak that remains in him even now. Why does Benedict muddy the waters instead of simply making it clear that he will cease entirely to be Pope rather than simply losing the power of the office? 
do we not see here yet another example of the blurring of concepts that has plagued the church since Vatican II, or what the genius Romano Amerio called a loss of essences? The clear distinction between one thing and another in post concilial thinking. Must we now accommodate an, an ambiguity, even as to the nature of the papal office? Have we seen the emergence of the latest post conciliar novelty in the church, the quasi pope? Unquote. The post conciliar church, in fact, gave us the quasi bishop, the bishop emeritus who no longer actively governs a diocese, but passively remains a bishop. Now Ratzinger gives us the Pope Emeritus, who no longer actively governs the Diocese of Rome or the Universal Church, but passively remains Pope. Three years later, in 2016, when Peter Seewald asked Benedict, quote, the Pope, the representative of Christ on earth, must have a particularly close, intimate relationship to the Lord, Benedict replied in the present tense, 2016, quote, I do not have the feeling that he is far away. I am always able to speak to him inwardly, unquote. Now, according to metaphysics, an effect only exists by the virtue of the power of its cause. The effect of turning a man into a pope is produced by the dispositive efficient cause of his acceptance of election and by the perfective efficient co cause, who is God Almighty. Becoming Pope, in turn, is the efficient cause of the further effect of becoming shepherd, belonging completely to everyone, his flock. Yet Ratzinger claims, quote, his decision to renounce the act of exercise, unquote, of the Petrine ministry does not revoke the Petrine effect of belonging to everyone. Now, the effect in his soul of belonging to the whole church could not remain if the efficient cause, being Pope, was completely removed. Therefore, Ratzinger held that he remained within, quote, the precincts of St. Peter, unquote. He thought that when he became Pope in 2005, he received a sacramental munis, not simply a juridical office, but a munis to teach, sanctify, and govern, as Vatican II teaches each bishop receives when sacramentally consecrated. A bishop does not lose these munira, when he becomes Bishop Emeritus. And for Ratzinger, neither does a Pope when he becomes Pope Emeritus. As Cardinal Peter Erdo explains, quote, as in the Second Vatican Council, even in the new code of canon law, Munis not infrequently also has a special theological meaning of the three munira gifts of Christ and of the church. Passages in which the legislator speaks of the munis of Peter or the Roman pontiff are connected with this sense of gift. But contrary to Ratzinger and Erdo, however, pre-Vatican II Cardinal Below explains a proper papal resignation means there is no gift or munis, nothing of popeness remaining. Quote, there is absolutely no doubt that pontifical power in the line of Peter can come to an end, just as this person first began to be legitimate when he accepted his election as supreme pontiff 
So he ceases to be as soon as by resignation, he destroys the effect of the election in himself. It plainly follows from the very fact of abdication that he is free of the pontificate. Canon law states an act placed out of error concerning something which constitutes its substance is invalid. Canon 188 says a resignation made out of substantial error is invalid by the law itself. If Benedict thought he could resign the administrative duties, but remain papal enough to still belong to all his flock, then his resignation was void out of error concerning something which constitutes its substance. The church has one shepherd, not two, who belongs to all his sheep. Thank you. All right, Matt Gaspers, you're, I'm going to reset the clock here, and you're going to have 10 minutes to uh, present your case. You are free, obviously, Please. to respond um, to uh, Dr. Maza, or before, if you have any questions. Right. Before we start, can I just give a couple minute background as to how this came about for the folks? <laughs> sure. Oh, okay. Sure. So, you're not on the clock. All right. So thank you, everybody who's watching live. We appreciate you being here. I just wanted to give a little explanation of how this discussion debate came about. It's really more of a friendly discussion, I think, among uh, brothers in Christ, really, than a formal debate, per se. Um, but as some of you may know, if you subscribe to Catholic Family News, I wrote a two-part series, uh, which appeared in the February and March issues of the paper this year, in response to a conference that Dr. Maza held last December, um, with a group of colleagues called, and Dr. Maza can chime in if I get this wrong, but I think it was called Is the Pope Catholic? Uh, a conference seeking the truth about the two popes. And it was last December. And it had been a while since we covered this subject in the paper, so I thought it might be a good idea to revisit it. And then I did a show about this two-part series with Kennedy Hall, uh, I think maybe a month ago or so, and Dr. Maza reached out and wondered if if either Kennedy or I might be interested in debating the subject. And so I gave it some thought and prayer and thought it would be helpful. I mean, one reason why I wanted to have this discussion slash debate is to show, um, you know, by God's grace that two brothers of Christ and sons of the church can disagree on a very important subject and still be charitable and, and civil towards each other and still remain friends, which I hope uh, this this discussion debate communicates to the audience. So that's kind of the general background. I don't know if, if Ed wanted to add anything to that. More power to you. <laughs> All right. Um, so yeah, I think that's pretty much the, the background there. And I can go ahead and give my side of the story. I think and we'll I mean we'll obviously get into more of the the details as the discussion, the debate goes on, but um I will try to respond to, you can go ahead and start the clock, Mike, and I'll try to respond to some of the points that Dr. Maza brought up in his opening statement. So uh, first of all, I noticed that he quoted from a very important address of Benedict XVI, his last general audience, which was February 27th, 2013. And I quoted that in the first part of my two-part series so I'm just going to read from that text. He said here, this is Benedict speaking, allow me to go back again to uh, April 19th, 2005. The real gravity of the decision was also due to the fact that from that moment on, I was engaged always and forever by the Lord. Always, anyone who accepts the Petrine ministry, interesting that he refers to it as ministry and not um, office there, no longer has any privacy. He belongs always and completely to everyone, to the whole church. In a manner of speaking, the private dimension of his life is completely eliminated. I was able to experience, and I experience it even now, that one receives one's life precisely when one gives it away. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. He says, or he said rather, uh, February 27, 2013, the always is also a forever, per sempre, in the original Italian. There can no longer be a return to the private sphere. 
My decision to resign the active exercise of the ministry does not revoke this. And that's what Dr. Maza quoted. I do not return to private life, to a life of travel, meetings, receptions, conferences, and so on. I am not abandoning the cross, but remaining in a new way at the side of the crucified Lord. I no longer bear the power of office for the governance of the church. So again, he's re recognizing, I no longer bear the power of office for the governance of the church, but in the service of prayer, I remain, so to speak, in the enclosure of St. Peter. Uh, St. Benedict, whose name I bear as Pope, will be a great example for me in this. He showed us the way for a life which, whether active or passive, is completely given over to the work of God, end quote. Um, it's very ironic that during that same general audience, Benedict went on to ask for prayers, quote, for the cardinals who are called to so weighty a task, that is, of electing his successor, as he explicitly stated in his Declaratio, a text I think we'll get to later in the debate. Um, and Benedict goes on, and for the new successor of the apostle Peter, may the Lord accompany him with the light and strength of his spirit, end quote. Furthermore, Benedict told English-speaking pilgrims in attendance that day, quote, The decision I have made after much prayer is the fruit of a serene trust in God's will and a deep love of Christ's church. I will continue to accompany the church with my prayers, and I ask each one of you to pray for me and for the new pope, end quote. So again, he seems to be recognizing what he said originally in his Declaratio. Maybe we can just put that up on the screen, Mike, if that's possible, um, so that folks can see the text of the Declaratio itself. If, we, if you're able to do that. Okay, there we go. So I'm not going to read the whole text now. We can certainly come back to this. I think we'll have to in order to give the full context of everything. But the debate really comes down to these two Latin words, munus, which Dr. Maza referred to, and also ministerium. And as you can see, I've, I've highlighted in yellow, they're, both terms are used. You have the Latin munus in the opening part of the Declaratio, then later on he switches to ministerium, ministerio. But ultimately, he ended the relevant portion of this text by saying, I renounce the ministry, ministerio, of Bishop of Rome, successor of St. Peter, in such a way that as from 28 February 2013 at 20 hundred hours, the See of Rome, the See of St. Peter, will be vacant, and a conclave to elect the new Supreme Pontiff will have to be convoked by those whose competence it is. So as he recognized in the Declaratio, he reiterated in his final general audience that he is vacating the chair of Peter. Um, Dr. Maza, of course, holds that he was in substantial error, which invalidated it. We'll have to get into more of the specifics as the debate goes on. We can take that slide, I think, off for now. Um, Ed also mentioned in his opening statement, he talked about a Peter Seewald interview. I don't think I quote from the particular portion that he did in my article series, but I do quote, I know Dr. Maza has mentioned this before in, in public talks. I think he mentioned it last December. So this is from um, the interview, the book length interview published in November of 2016. And it's in chapter two, the resignation, we find the following exchange between Seewald and Benedict. Um, so Seewald says, in the resignation speech, the reason you gave for relinquishing your office was the diminishing of your energy, but it is, but is a slowdown in the ability to perform reason enough to climb down from the chair of Peter. Benedict answers, one can of course make that accusation, but it would be a functional misunderstanding. The follower of Peter is not merely bound to a function. The office enters into your very being. And this is where Dr. Mazath I think he can correct me if I'm wrong, sees the substantial error that Fran that Benedict somehow has a sacramental understanding of the papacy, that it's essentially a sacrament as opposed to a juridical office. So Benedict says, in this regard, fulfilling a function is not the only criteria. However, at the end of this answer, Benedict ultimately says, um, if the, ca the capability to do them is no longer there, 
Uh, so let me back up a little bit. Uh, even if you say a few of these things can be struck off, like the practical duties of the office, there, uh, there remain so many things which are essential that if the capability to do them is no longer there, for me anyway, someone else might see it otherwise. Now's the time to free up the chair. So again, even in this answer where he seems to have a, a little bit of a strange understanding of what it means to be Pope, he ultimately says, now's the time to free up the chair. As he said in his declaratio, the chair will be vacant. And I think we'll, as the debate goes on, we'll get more into the distinctions about uh, munus versus ministerium. I don't want to spend too much time on that right now. I do want to quote, however, from Cardinal Louis Below, since uh, Dr. Maza brought him up. And I do have a slide for that. It's kind of a lengthy, um, a lengthy quotation, but it's worth going through. So I think, Mike, this is labeled like number one, Cardinal Below, quote, UPA in parentheses. Let's see if, yeah, there we go. So uh, Cardinal Louis Below is a, a renowned pre-conciliar, pre-Vatican II theologian. He was appointed to the Holy Office during the reign of St. Pius X. And I think he may have had a hand in composing the encyclical Pascendi Dominici Gregis on uh, the modernist heresy, the synthesis of all heresies as Pius X defined it. This is a very important quote for, for my position in this debate is that if the church peacefully and universally accepts a man as the Pope, um, he is the Pope. And that's essentially what Below says in this quote. So I'll try to get through this before my 10 minutes expires here. So this is from his work, Tractatus de Ecclesia Christi, his tract on the Church of Christ. And he's talking, to, I think in this section, he's talking about the possibility of a heretical Pope, as we'll see in the quote. Uh, finally, Below says, whatever you still think about the possibility or impossibility of the aforementioned hypothesis of a Pope heretic, at least one point must be considered absolutely incontrovertible and placed firmly above any doubt whatever. The adhesion of the universal church will always in itself be an infallible sign of the legitimacy of a determined pontiff and therefore also of the existence of all the conditions required for the legitimacy itself. It is not necessary to look far for this, the proof of this, but we find it immediately in the promise and in the infallible providence of Christ. And then he provides two quotes from the Gospel of St. Matthew. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it, Matthew 16. And behold, I shall be with you all days, from Matthew 28. Uh, he goes on, for the adhesion of the church to a false pontiff would be the same as its adhesion to a false rule of faith, seeing that the Pope is the living rule of faith, which the church must follow and which, in fact, she always follows. Now, just a brief side note on that. Obviously, the Pope, the magisterium, is what we call in theology the proximate rule of faith. But there is also something called the remote rule of faith, which is scripture and tradition itself, the deposit of faith, which is above and beyond, uh, the, which stands above the proximate rule, the living pope and the bishops. So we don't just blindly follow whatever the, whatever the pope and bishops say if it's clearly in contradiction to the remote rule of faith. Uh, for a great treatment of this subject, I highly recommend a booklet by Father Chad Ripperger called The Binding Force of Tradition. Maybe we can get, might get back into that subject later on. Um, but to get back to this Cardinal Below quote, he says, God can permit that at times a vacancy in the apostolic see be prolonged for a long time. He can also permit doubt to arise about the legitimacy of this or that election. He cannot, he cannot however, permit that the whole church accept as pontiff he who is not so truly and legitimately. Therefore, Below concludes, from the moment in which the Pope is accepted by the church and united to her as the head of the body, it is no longer permitted to raise doubts about a possible vice of election or a possible lack of any condition whatsoever necessary for legitimacy. For the aforementioned adhesion of the church heals in the root all fault in the election and proves infallibly the existence of all the required conditions, end quote. All right, well, it looks like my time's up, so we'll, we'll leave it there for now.
Dr. Maza, I just I have some questions that I want to ask you, and then you know you can answer uh, whatever you'd like to as well. Uh, in addition to what Matt brought up, but he's brought up I, I think what uh, what probably from the classical recognize and resist camp is is the silver bullet, which is universal peaceful acceptance. Does this poll that's on the screen here look like universal peaceful acceptance to you? And how would you respond? Well. That's the thing. You see, universal peaceful acceptance is not strictly defined as to what constitutes universal peaceful acceptance. As you point out, this poll shows that uh, nearly half of the Catholics surveyed here uh, don't recognize him as the tr as the true pope. Uh, but th there there are, there are three different objections I could raise to the thesis of universal peaceful acceptance. I think the strongest one, since I am an historian of medieval history, is one that I brought up during the conference that Matt referenced um, back in December. And that is, um, let me pull up my document here and see if I can find the quote that, uh, that I'm looking for. Uh, yeah, this, this will do. Um, see, the thing is this, I have no trouble accepting universal peaceful acceptance uh, in 99% of the cases when the previous pope is dead and buried. Uh, it seems as though universal peaceful acceptance of the current pope is a, a valid way of determining if he is valid. But it doesn't work when the previous pope is, is still alive. So let me give a quick example from... Um, So Bishop Schneider has talked about this. Bishop Schneider of Kazakhstan, who is otherwise a good and holy bishop, he says here, and this is to reiterate what, what Matt was just saying, quote, the practice of the church makes it evident, even in the case of an invalid election, this election will be de facto healed through the general acceptance of the new elected by the overwhelming majority of the cardinals and bishops, unquote. But historical fact contradicts this theological theory. Take the case of the illegal election of Pope Clement VII while Urban VI was still alive. Dr. Warren Carroll relates, quote, on September 20th, 1378, 11 French cardinals and Pedro de Luna of Spain elected Cardinal Robert of Geneva Pope. The three Italian cardinals accepted Robert when he was enthroned, taking the name of Clement VII. So against Bishop Schneider and against Matt's, Matt's position, this invalid election, it was invalid because the Pope was still alive, Urban VI, was not healed when all the cardinals universally and peacefully accepted Clement. Urban VI had no cardinals on his side. He only had Catherine of Siena, which I'll, I'll get into in a second here. So the fact that all the cardinals accepted Clement did not uh, uh, you know, heal this invalid election. Uh, for 600 years, Clement has been reckoned an anti-pope and Urban the true pope. So likewise, if Benedict was alive and still the valid pope, all the cardinals accepting Francis would not heal Francis's invalid election. Um, well, I, I don't have to give the uh, exact quote here from St. Catherine. I could, uh, I can wait on that. But how's that for a preliminary answer? Maybe Matt wants to say something. Yeah, I'd just like to respond, and I mentioned this in my article series. I'm I'm confused, and I'm trying to understand how there's a contradiction because, you know, with Benedict the Sixteenth, and we'll get into the difference. You know, the minis, munis versus ministerium and substantial error, all of that. But I mean, just given on face value what he said in his Declaratio, of February eleventh, twenty thirteen that the see of Saint Peter will be vacant as a result of what he's doing. And it will be vacant as of uh, February 28th at 2000 hours. 
I don't think there's a parallel situation here because Urban the Sixth never resigned. As I'm sure you well know, Dr. Mazza, he was the reason why the Cardinals who elected him turned on him in the months following his election is that be, is because he had a radical change in character, I think is a fair way to say it. Um, he was basically being very harsh and, I mean, to the point of kind of being, maybe he lost touch with reality or something. Um, but that's that's essentially the gripe that the Cardinals had with him is that they didn't like the way that he was treating them. He was being unreasonable and and tyrannical, basically. Um, but there was, I mean, first of all, there was peaceful and universal acceptance of uh, Pope Urban the Sixth, elected in the, uh, actually was elected twice on April eighth of thirteen seventy eight, just to be to sure they could be because there were um, there was kind of a tumult tumult in the city of Rome, and the cardinals felt like they were under pressure to elect a Roman or at least an Italian. And so they held two different conclaves on the same day to make sure this is legit. So after they elected him, they went on to enthrone him first in the Vatican Palace, then in St. John Lateran. They solemnly crowned him April 18th in St. Peter's Basilica. And then he started having going off, you know, on these weird behaviors and treating them weird and badly. So they decided to um, elect someone else in his place because they decided. Um, they decided that maybe it wasn't valid after all. Uh, you brought up um, uh, St. Catherine of Siena. And interestingly, I have a qu I quote um, from, I don't know if we have, if you can show this on the screen. I'm holding the, the book here that I quote, I guess, yeah, here we go. So this is a three volume set called A History of the Catholic Church by Monsignor Philip Hughes, available from Loretto Publications. I think it's a pretty solid history of the church. And in that book is quote, uh, St. Catherine of Siena is quoted as following. She said, so she was writing to the, to the uh, schismatic cardinals who went against Urban VI, whom they had already solemnly in, uh, enthroned and everything. I know what motivates you to denounce him, your self-love, which can brook no correction. For before he began to bite you with words and wished to draw the thorns out of your sweet garden, so she apparently was not very sympathetic to the, to the schismatic cardinals, you confessed and announced to us, the little sheep, that Pope Urban VI was true pope, end quote. So I guess I would argue that the Great Western Schism itself occurred precisely because the cardinals of the day chose to reject the man whom they had peacefully and universally accepted as the Pope. That would be my position. So uh, so here's the deal. Um, history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. <laughs> so here's the core issue. Urban VI was universally and peacefully accepted as Pope. Pope Benedict the Sixteenth was universally and peacefully accepted as Pope. They were mm. both legitimate popes. The uh, they the cardinals elected Clement the Seventh as the new pope, while the true pope was still alive. But according to universal peaceful acceptance, that invalid election should have been healed because he was universally and peacefully accepted. There was no other cardinals supporting Urban the Sixth. Mm. Similarly. If Pope Benedict, who was still alive, messed up his resignation, then that means he was still Pope. So if he was still Pope, the conclave that elected Francis was illegal, invalid, and it cannot be healed by universal peaceful acceptance the same way that Clement VII's election was not healed by universal peaceful acceptance. It's that mm -hmm. simple. Okay, I see. I think I see what you're saying. That um, peaceful and universal acceptance seems it has to be premised on the fact that the chair is em actually is empty. Correct. Okay. So, and the, obviously we know that the, the chair was not empty in the 1300s because Urban the Sixth occupied it. The the contention is, <laughs> was the chair empty on March 13th, 2013? Obviously. Correct. And you are correct. You said earlier that this is not this is not a defined dogma of the church, but I would like to emphasize it is a very common opinion. It's not like some isolated um, minority opinion among theologians. I can, and I would like to quote one other, if I could, 
regard because uh, Mike brought up earlier, you know, it, it doesn't look like we have peaceful or universal acceptance of Francis right now, but the definition of that is not actually just uh, it's it. What matters is how it was at the time of the election, and if people and if doubts seem to arise later on, um, and we all know the last eleven years have been a roller coaster to say the least. There's plenty of reasons to have concerns and possibly even doubts, but according to John of Saint Thomas, for example, who wrote a lengthy treatise on this subject in the I think the 1600s, if I recall correctly. And I do have a slide for a couple, one quote in particular that I'd like to show. This is, uh, Mike, it's number, let's see, pulled up. I think it should be slide number four, four JST quote two. I don't know if that makes, I think that's how I named it. Oh, I think it's in the other set of slides. That's the substantive, there we go. So this is John of St. Thomas, who's recognized as one of the foremost interpreters of um, St. Thomas Aquinas, hence his religious name, John of St. Thomas. He was also a Dominican. This is kind of what the essence of peaceful and universal acceptance and what that means. Um, he says, the church accepts the election and the elect as a matter of faith. Um, the election and the elected one are proposed by the cardinals, not in their own person, but in the person of the church and by her power. And just for time's sake, I'm kind of really focusing on what's in yellow, the main points of the quote. Wherefore, they in this respect and for this task are the church herself representatively. Thus, the cardinals represent the church in all that concerns the election of her head, the successor of Peter. So it's really, if the cardinal electors say this is the Pope, um, and then it goes on to be accepted by the rest of the church, as he says at the end of the quote, it is the church whose ministers they are that by its acceptance ultimately confirms as a truth of faith the fact that this man is truly the highest rule of faith and the supreme pontiff. And then there's one other slide, if we could go to the next slide, and then I'll give Ed an opportunity to respond if, if he wants to. So it should be slide number five. It's another one from John of St. Thomas. Yeah, there it is. Okay. So in this same treatise, uh, he says, all that remains to be determined then is the exact moment when the acceptance of the church becomes sufficient to render the proposition de fide. Uh, and he asks a couple of questions in that regard. And he ultimately says, I reply that the unanimous election of the cardinals and their declaration is similar to a definition given by the bishops of a council legitimately gathered. Moreover, the acceptance of the church is for us like a confirmation of this declaration. Now, the acceptance of the church is realized both negatively by the fact that the church does not contradict the news of the election wherever it becomes known, and positively by the gradual acceptance of the prelates of the church, beginning with the place of the election and spreading throughout the rest of the world. As soon as men see or hear that a pope has been elected and that the election is not contested, which to my knowledge it, it wasn't by any of the cardinal electors or in, even any bishops until about four years after the fact with Bishop Gracida, I think was one of the first, um, they are obliged to believe him or excuse me, to believe that that man is the Pope and to accept him. So now if, if Ed wants to respond. Matt, let me, can I ask you a clarifying question? Let me just jump sure. in. Um, we're, we're all traditionalists here. We all love the Latin mass. We, we're all kind of on the same side about things. I guess my question would be, you're, you're quoting John of St. Thomas here, and, and, and he's saying that the unanimous election of the cardinals in their declaration is similar to a definition given by the bishops of a council. Yet, don't you also hold the recognize and resist position in which you reject the, the 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 Second Vatican Council or large parts of it? I mean, they they give definitions in that council. So why should we believe him on the one hand and not the other? And I'm and I'm not I'm not pulling for one side or the other. I just want right. to ask this clarifying question. Sure, I think that's a fair question. I think the the answer for me is that the key word is definition. So. As you know, Vatican II doesn't actually offer any dogmatic, any new dogmatic definitions, I should say. It reiterates in numerous places already defined dogmas, which I certainly accept. What I have trouble with in Vatican II are certain novelties 
which is probably not even most of the conciliar documents or the most of the, like the majority of the conciliar texts, um, stuff like Nostre Tate, for example, which is not a definition by any stretch of the imagination. It's basically a pastoral program that is based on the, the virtue of prudence and not on the supernatural virtue of faith. And we are free to have concerns and objections to those sorts of things. Um, I think the same is true, certainly, for the Declaration on um, Ecumenism, perhaps even you know stuff on religious liberty. But there's plenty of stuff in the conciliar text that I don't object to because it's simply a reiteration of traditional Catholic doctrine. Dr. Mazza, in preparation for t- this evening, I listened to your interview with uh, Taylor Marshall. And one of the things that you guys dove deeply into, which I hope you can touch on here, is the idea that, speaking of Vatican II, that uh, there was an introduction of a a new concept of of, uh, ecclesiology uh, in Vatican II, and that is the precursor to the synod on synodality that we had today. Tie that in, if you will, for the audience to your belief of Ratzinger's conception of the papacy and how that radically was different from uh, perhaps how his success, his predecessors saw it. Uh, sure thing. Uh, yes, it. The reason why we have a Pope Emeritus is because Vatican II uh, gave us the Bishop Emeritus. And how did Vatican II give us the Bishop Emeritus? Uh, I sort of wrote this up a little bit. So, it, if you would concede to me a little time here, I'll I'll get through this as quickly as possible. That's fine. Uh, so thank you, Matt. So, uh, as I say, Pope Benedict thought that he could give his chair to a success, successor yet remain papal. Uh, to prove that such a resignation was invalid, all I really have to do is demonstrate that he had an erroneous understanding of the nature of the papacy. And this is not difficult, since he first demonstrated such errors in the 1960s. Now, here's the thing. At Vatican I in 1870, the Relatio, the official explanation of its documents, stated, quote, the bishops succeed the apostles not as succeeding to a universal apostolate, but rather to an episcopate as rulers of individual churches, unquote. At Vatican II, this Vatican I teaching was supposed to be reaffirmed, but Joseph Ratzinger and a faction of modernist bishops revolted. They refused to accept this schema. They wanted the bishops to share a universal apostolate over the church as colleagues of the Pope. Ratzinger himself explains, quote, in the original 1962 draft, the requirement for membership in the Apostolic College of Bishops was jurisdiction, the power to govern, over a particular diocese, jurisdiction conferred by the Pope. The college in the long run would be nothing more than an institution of papal privilege and the great idea of collegiality threatened to evaporate, unquote. Well, Ratzinger got his way. Vatican II gave the bishops taken collectively equal power with the Pope. Quote, the Roman pontiff has universal power over the church. The order of bishops, which succeeds to the college of apostles, is also the subject of supreme and full power over the universal church, unquote. And just to interject, you're quoting from Lumen Gentium, is that right? That's right. Okay. And Vatican II goes, and Lumen Gentium also goes on to say that the bishops get their power to govern, not from papal jurisdiction alone, but from divine gift. Quote, and this is where I'm going to tie this in, Mike, with uh, your question. The bishops, this is Lumen Gentium, the bishops, the successors of the apostles are joined together. One is constituted a member of the Episcopal body in virtue of sacramental consecration. Episcopal consecration, together with the munus of sanctifying, 
also confers the munira, which is the plural of munis, of teaching and governing. So as Ratzinger, main, as, and, and Ratzinger summarizes this, he says, quote, this is Ratzinger, the church is not like a circle with a single center, the Pope, but like an ellipse with two foci, primacy and episcopate. Or as Vatican II says, quote, it pertains to the bishops to admit newly elected members into the Episcopal body by means of the sacrament of orders. Now, what's what's wrong with all of this? Why is this off? Well, Ratzinger and the rebels are contradicting Pope Pius IV, who in 1786 condemned the error that, quote, every bishop is called by God as much as the Pope is to the government of the church, that what some men believe can be obtained only from the Supreme Pontiff and granted only by him, insofar as it depends upon consecration and ecclesiastical jurisdiction, can be obtained equally from every bishop. Now, how do we tie this together here? Well, the, you, I think you, did yeah. you mean Pius the Sixth? Uh, no, this is Pius IV in 1786. Oh, I if think, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, Pius, I think Pius IV was back during the Council of Trent days. I, I could be mistaken. Oh, but Pius I, VI, I, maybe I'm off ahead. on that. <laughs> go ahead. But here's the thing: uh, the what what Vatican II said is that bishops get their power to govern not so much by a, a grant of jurisdiction from the Pope, but through a uh, sacramental ordination and therefore the moon is to teach to sanctify to govern is irrevocable so what has ratzinger done i maintain that ratzinger has applied this logic to the papacy itself and is saying that the papacy is not a juridical office that comes and goes it has that component but it's more than that it's a moonus it's a divine gift uh, that is irrevocable. As, as scripture says, the gifts of God are, are irrevocable. Um, and now how do I know this? Am I, am I, cause some people, not you, <laughs> but some people have accused me of reading Ratzinger's mind. Uh, you know, uh, and the, the, the answer is I don't have to read his mind in his introduction to theology from 1982. He says that Munis is different from ministerium or ministerio. It's different. Munis is the divine gift. It's theological. And ministry is the practical application of that. It's the, it's the carrying out. Now that you have the gift, you can carry out the mission, you see. Um, and this is why, if we want to pull this discussion back to the Declaratio, he talks about the Munis, but then at the very end, when he's supposed to renounce the monus, he doesn't renounce the monus. He renounces the ministry of the Bishop of Rome. Why does he only renounce the ministry of the Bishop of Rome? Because he is like a Bishop Emeritus. He is giving the see to his successor, just like a Bishop Emeritus gives his see to a successor. I, I, I'm ready, I, I stipulate for, for purposes of this discussion, that Benedict expected a successor, that Benedict acknowledged Francis as the Supreme Pontiff. It's true. However, the, the problem is there is no such thing as a Pope Emeritus. Again, a Bishop Emeritus is a bishop who still remains a bishop once he gives up the practical governance of his diocese to a successor. And a Pope Emeritus, according to Ratzinger, still remains Pope even though he's given up the administration of the new, of the uh, diocese or the see to his successor. Uh, and that's a, an, an error in substance. Uh, and and uh, before the end of this discussion tonight, I'm sure we'll get into more specifics as to what constitutes substantial error. Uh, but that would be my, my two cents on this. Dr. Mazza, thank you so much. I, I have a question I want to ask of Matt Gaspers and then Matt, of course you can respond to the, to the good doctor as you see fit. And, and we and we have to talk about substantial error as well. So I think we'll go there next. Yeah. Um, but you you brought up you brought up the 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 various Latin terminology, 
And so I have two part question for you, Matt. First of all, can can a, a, a question that that is of this magnitude really come down to two very similar Latin words? <laughs> I mean, um, I mean, and, and, and I'll ask the same question of, of Dr. Mazo when the time comes. Um, so actually, I, l- let me just start there and, and get your take on it. And then I'll ask the second to follow up on that. Yeah, I mean, it, I think ultimately this debate in many ways does come down to the munis versus ministerium and are they synonyms? Um, you know, our mutual friend Ryan Grant is a Latinist. So I, I quote from, a, I think it was a 2018 article of his for 1 Peter 5, where he addressed this subject. Um, let me just read the quote. So this is from the first, uh, first half of my two-part series on uh, Is Francis the True Pope? So Ryan wrote in 2018, The argument about a difference between munus and ministerium does not hold water for several reasons. The first is that they are more or less synonymous. Munus can mean a gift, although even though, although even there, it is not disconnected from the notion that it is a gift that carries responsibility. In ecclesiastical parlance, Ryan says, it typically means an office or duty. Thus the episcopate and the papacy is considered a munus, uh, properly speaking. In this sense, it is roughly synonymous with officium, which is the Roman word for duty. Ministerium can mean a ministry or service, but it also means office or duty in the sense of the essence of what the munus entails. And he goes into some specifics from some Latin dictionaries, but ultimately he says, well, let me see. He says here, St. Thomas Aquinas refers to the use of ministerium to refer to the power and office of the papacy, and then provides a quote. Uh, Some power was also conferred to ministers of the church who are dispensers of the sacraments to remove the obstacle, not of itself, but of the divine power and the power of the passion of Christ. And this power is metaphorically called the key of the church, which is the key of service or clavis ministerii. So Ryan says, Uh, At the end of this section of his article, the conclusion we can draw is that munus and ministerium were meant by Pope Benedict to mean the same thing. It is not unusual in vernacular and modern parlance to use office and ministry as one and the same word, end quote. And uh, I also wanted to mention, as I do in my article, uh, Cardinal Raymond Burke, who I think we all know is a very um, renowned uh, canonist, Latinist, etc., former prefect of the Apostolic Signatura under Benedict XVI, and he told LifeSite News in 2019 an answer to this question about Munus versus Ministerium that, quote, it seems clear that he, Benedict, uses interchangeably Munus and Ministerium. It doesn't seem that he's making a distinction between the two, uh, end quote, and further that, quote, it's clear from the declaration that he was renouncing the Munus. So that's Cardinal Burke's take on the matter for, for what that's worth. Can I interject here, gentlemen? Yeah. Please. So uh, with all due respect to Cardinal Burke, uh, Cardinal Peter Erdo of Hungary wrote an article on this, Munus Ministerium Officium, back in the 1980s in Latin and uh, I, it's the definitive, it's one of the definitive remarks on this. Okay. So that trumps Cardinal Burke. And he also trumps Ryan Grant with all due respect to him. And what trumps everything is you can go back and read Ratzinger's introduction to theology where Ratzinger himself talks about the difference between Munus, the divine gift and ministerium, which is the practical carrying out of the ministry. Let me let me ask you a follow up on that, Doctor Maza. Uh, if uh, explain to the audience how uh, into the world and, and to Matt Gasper <laughs> as uh, as as best as you can, how could it be possible that if if Cardinal Ratzinger does not have a has an improper understanding of the office of the papacy, how could he at once legitimately receive it, but n- be incapable of dispensing with it? I'm so glad you asked that question. Very simple. Uh, When he accepted the papacy on April 19th, 2005, he took it, whatever it, it was, he wholeheartedly embraced it. Okay. 
So whatever the, the papacy is, he accepted it. He embraced it. So there was no impediment. Okay. However, now that in, in, in February 11th, 2013, he announced that he's going to give it up, but he's not going to give it up because he says in his declaratio, and later we can look at the individual words, he says that the munis of Peter is not merely doing and acting. The munis of Peter is also suffering and praying. And as he makes clear in his last Wednesday audience, he's not giving up the munis of praying and suffering. Okay, what he calls the passive ministry. He's only giving up the active ministry. And that's why in his declaratio, he says, I'm giving up the ministry of the Bishop of Rome. You guys are going to have a new bishop to run Rome and to run the universal church. I'm not going to stand in his way. But guess what? You better still call me his holiness. And I'm still going to give apostolic blessings in my own name as if I'm pope. How can he do this? Mm -hmm. Because Ratzinger maintains that what he received when he became pope, this spiritual office as right, is irrevocable. But the problem is before Vatican II, nobody talked like this. Right. So the, his error in understanding the papacy only comes into effect because he doesn't leave it. It's like it's like s somebody getting married. Uh, you know, unfortunately, t maybe tens of thousands of Catholic marriages or just marriages in general are not real marriages in the eyes of God. Even though everybody went to the wedding, they've got kids, they've got m a mortgage to pay <laughs> because, you know, as, as, as a court as a clerical court will, will show, they, their marriage is invalid because they didn't have the right intention or other circumstances that would invalidate the marriage. Uh, so I hope that makes it clear why it's his exit and not his entry, which is problematic. Let me throw it over to Matt as well. You can respond to that, Matt. But uh, what, wouldn't, you, wouldn't you agree that uh, at a minimum, it's very confusing when there are two guys in white, both called Pope, both called, uh, you know, your holiness, both giving apostolic blessings, both wearing the red shoes. Well, actually, I guess only Ratzinger wore the red shoes. But <laughs> um, I, I guess the question would be, like, wouldn't you agree that there's something about this situation that has led, you know, these 47% of people to say, well, Frank the Tank, he's not the real guy. <laughs> yeah, I think that's fair. That's more than fair. It was certainly a very, it was an unprecedented, not just an odd, it was an unprecedented situation to have two men in the Vatican, um, you know, one in the, in the, what was it? The, um, the monastery, I forget the name of it off the top of my head, Mo mother of the church. I think he living in, you know, and walking around the Vatican gardens and the white cassock and everything, having the same personal secretary he had when he was the Pope sharing him for many years. I think, uh, what did Archbishop Ganswine go? I can't imagine what that was like for him going back and forth. That must've been very weird. Um, but ultimately, I think Benedict, I mean, if he thought that he was somehow retaining some of the papacy, I think obviously he was mistaken because it is a juridical office. It's not a it's not a sacrament. It's not something that cannot be lost. That's never been the teaching of the church. Um, I guess what I always come back to is in the Declaratio towards the end, as I quoted in my opening remarks, you know, he says, let me get the quote. Um, and I don't know, maybe if you want to throw it up on the screen, you can, Mike, and maybe we can transition. Into the, well, before you do that, I did want to bring up one other quote from Lumen Gentium. Um, but Benedict says in his uh, Declaratio that from 28 February 2013, 20 hundred hours, the Sea of Rome, the Sea of St. Peter. So that that's not just the active exercise. That is, the, he's saying the Sea of Rome, the Sea of St. Peter, the Chair of Peter, will be vacant and a conclave to elect not just a new bishop but the new supreme pontiff will have to be convoked by those whose competence it is so i, I don't understand how benedict could say he's retaining the office but at the same time saying the chair is going to be vacant and a new supreme pontiff is going to be elected i don't understand how those two things can match up um, before we continue on, I did want to bring up one quote from Lumen Gentium. I think this is number, this is number 20. 
And I do have to give credit to a friend of mine, Stephen O'Reilly, who's written a book on the subject, um, Valid Question Mark. Um, I forget the subtitle offhand, but let me see here. The Resignation of Pope Benedict the Sixteenth uh, was published a couple years ago, and he does bring up in his book. He's also written on it on his blog that uh, Lumen Gentium uh, Article Twenty does seem to use um, munus and ministerium interchangeably. So this is the relevant passage from there. It says, just to give a little back. So this portion of the text, it's talking about. The divine mission entrusted by Christ to the apostles will last until the end of the world. Uh, since the gospel they are to teach is for all time the source of all life for the church. And for this reason, the apostles appointed as rulers in this society took care to appoint successors. Um, and here's where we get into the distinction. It goes on to say, they therefore appointed such men and gave them the order that when they should have died, other approved men would take up their ministry in Latin ministerium. Among those various ministries, ministeria in Latin, which according to tradition were exercised in the church from the earliest times, the chief place belongs to the office in Latin munus of those who appointed to the episcopate. Um, let see here. Pointed to the episcopate. Sorry, I lost my place in the quote here. Um, oh, here we go. Uh, belong to the office of those who appointed to the episcopate by a succession running from the beginning are passers on of the apostolic seed. So in that quote, there seem they seem to be the, the drafters of that text and the bishops and ultimately the Pope who approved it seem to be using ministerium and munus interchangeably there. I don't know if if Dr. Mazza has a response for that. Oh, sure. Yeah, thank you, Matt. Um, can, may, may I quote the Godfather? Go right ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, you're, you're my brother and I love you, but never, never take sides with the CIA against the family <laughs> again. <laughs> Full disclosure, Stephen O'Reilly, my comic book nemesis, you know, like Spider-Man and the Green Goblin. Um, Stephen O'Reilly, who wrote the book Valid to to discredit my Maza positions here and, and other, you know, people that maintain that <laughs> Benedict is, is uh, probably still the Pope or was. Uh, he, he worked for the CIA. Uh, and I don't know why uh, in your article in February and in your article in March, you, you chose to basically the, the main ammunition that you used against my position is is from the cia i mean if if you want to trust a three-letter person trust a phd <laughs> not the cia i mean uh but it, you know all kidding aside um let's let's take someone who again is not a cia agent uh how about professor anna slawakowska uh, from uh, a, a, a prominent university in Poland. And she says here, uh, the knowledge of all the meanings of a given word, in this case, munis, is not enough to correctly identify the thoughts of the author of the translated text. The term munis uh, is most often analyzed in the literature with two others, officium and ministerium. Uh, and she goes on to explain, they are also synonymous with it, but at the same time, each of them can mean something different. Their use, whether separate or synonymous, always depends on the context of the utterance, the author's intention, or the purpose for which they are used, unquote. So I will go with the good professor over Stephen O'Reilly. I mean, he's a good guy, but uh, not uh, he's, he's off on the subject. Well, maybe now would be a good time to look at the, the Declaratio itself, and we can see that how the different terms are used. What do you sure. think, Mike? Yes, let's do that. And as a quick programming note and a heads up to the audience, after this, I'll have some uh, quick fire questions for both of you, and then we'll open it up to the live 
audience as well. So if you're in the live chat, I ask you to please refrain from the back and forth banter and start <laughs> submitting your questions uh, for the two gentlemen here. All right. I don't, Ed, do you want to read it or do you want me to read it? Or you can uh, go yeah. ahead and stop where you want to and give commentary. Uh, sure, sure thing. Um, okay. I don't think we need to read the whole thing. No, we it's where... Read the whole thing? Either way, whatever you think. Uh, okay, so uh, I have convoked you to this consistory, not only for the three canonizations, but also to communicate to you a decision of great importance for the life of the church. After having repeatedly examined my conscience before God, I have come to the certainty that my strengths due to an advanced age are no longer suited to an adequate exercise of the Petrine munis. Now he read this in uh, Latin, I believe. Right. And uh, just to give a side note of some background. So this is the, the Vatican, the English translation that's available on the Vatican website. And I also referenced the Latin original that's from the Vatican website. So that's where I'm getting the Latin terms inserted there. Right. And just as, as a side note, uh, Vatican translations, uh, there's issues with them and there's issues with the Vatican when it comes to documents and documents in English versus documents in other languages. So uh, I just, I'll throw that out there. But anyway, uh, in the original Latin text of his Declaratio, it's, it's munis, right? Uh, I am well aware that this ministry, munis, due to its essential spiritual nature, must be carried out not only with words and deeds, but no less with prayer and suffering. However, in today's world, subject to so many rapid changes and shaken by questions of deep relevance for the life of faith, in order to govern the bark of St. Peter and proclaim the gospel, both strength of mind and body are necessary. Strength, which in the last few months has deteriorated in me to the extent that I have had to recognize my incapacity to adequately fulfill the ministry and here it's in Latin ministerium, entrusted to me. For this reason, and well aware of the seriousness of this act, with full freedom, I declare that I renounce the ministry, and again, the Latin word he uses is ministerio, of Bishop of Rome, successor of St. Peter, entrusted to me by the cardinals on the 19th of April, 2005, in such a way that as from the 28th of February, 2013, at 20 hundred hours, the Sea of Rome, the Sea of St. Peter will be vacant and a conclave to elect the new Supreme Pontiff will have to be convoked by those whose competence it is. So I'll say a couple of things, I'll, then I'll turn it over to Matt. Um, there is a, an Italian canonist by the name of Francesco Patruno who argues that you can't resign by saying, you know, in two weeks from now at eight o'clock in the evening, that's when I will stop being Pope. And the reason why you can't do that is because it's like saying in two weeks from now at eight o'clock p.m., I'm going to be married to Mary Jane. It doesn't work like that. You see, becoming a pope or not be or not being pope anymore is one of those special instances in the life of the world where outside the sacraments, God actually makes you what you are. Right? Catholic theology is very clear on this. It's not the conclave that elects you. In fact, it's not even your acceptance of it, but it, the efficient cause, the perfective efficient cause is God himself. So if you're going to give up being Pope and God is going to take that away from you, it's like you're standing before God and, and you have to say the words and he takes it away from you. It's not something that you could designate, you know, on such and such a date, we're going to, we're going to be Splitsville. So this is, this is just the argument of Francesco Patruno, who's a mm -hmm. uh, professor of canon law in, in Italy. 
Um, I'll, I'll, I'll let I'll let Matt talk. Um, I'm not sure if I have a whole lot else to say on this other than I just I I come back to always you know his his statement the sea of of Rome the sea of Saint Peter will be vacant and a conclave to elect the new supreme pontiff will have to be convoked. I guess I don't understand what else that could mean other than there's going to be a new supreme pontiff. Ergo, I no longer will be. Um, but maybe now would be a good time to get into, you know, what what does canon law say about substantial error and and papal resignations? Uh, we have a couple of slides, Mike, in the um, so the slides for sub substantial error and papal resignation. I think slide number one in that set is should be canon 188, which is one of the crucial. Slide. Uh, I think it's further back from that one. That's commentary on Canon 188. Nope, still further back. I know I sent several. Uh, don't shoot me, but I don't think I have it. Oh, okay. I'll try to get uh, it while you talk. Okay, well, I can just. I'm. I mean, we both know the Canon, so it won't be a big mm -hmm. deal. But um, so Canon 188, and if Mike finds the slide, I had I provided the the Latin original because obviously the the text of canon law the the definitive authoritative text is of course the Latin text and then there are translations the English translation says a resignation made out of grave fear that is inflicted unjustly or out of malice substantial error or simony is invalid by the law itself so that is one of the crucial canons in this discussion, Canon 188. And I do have, you did bring up uh, slides that have commentary on Canon 188. So that might be helpful to review. Uh, so that there's one of them. So we'll, we can start with this one. This is a, a, com, a text and commentary on Canon law from the Canon Law Society of America published in 1986. And it says regarding substantial error, quote, Substantial error is a mistaken judgment that is not of minor importance and is truly a cause of the consequent decision. This would be the case in which the office holder judged that he or she had caused serious injury to someone when this was not the case. Um, so I don't know if Ed had anything he wanted to say on that. Oh, you know, that's, that's another canon we'll come to in just a minute. But the other there's more commentary on the code of canon law. Yeah, this is the slide I was talking about. So this is another um, huge tome of a text. It's commentary on the new 1983 code published in the year 2000. And it says, substantial error is a mistaken judgment which affects the essential elements of resignation in terms of either the cause or motivation for resignation or the nature of resignation and its consequences. And then they give an example. An example would be a diocesan finance officer who mistakenly thinks one must resign uh, when a new bishop is named, even though one's term has not expired. So that's the example that they give. And for, my, for myself, I don't see how this applies to the situation with Pope Benedict XVI I know Ed has a different take on this canon and the commentary, so he can give his take on it. Thank you, Matt. Uh, Mike, can you pull up uh, the, the slide 607? All right, so there's a professor of, uh, there's a lawyer in Italy, canon lawyer, uh, Giovanni Mascariello, and he wrote this tome, it's over 200 pages, just on substantial error and the history of substantial error and basically every Catholic authority that's ever talked about substantial error. So I'll, I, and I just highlighted one particular section here. I'll, I'll try to get through it. The false representation of the juridical function of the act to the erroneous perception of the object and its substantial qualities and to the erroneous assumption of the other contractor. The cause of the act, that is to say, the purpose that it, by natural law or positive legislation provision, achieves in the world of law, is the subject of substantial error when they misunderstand the essential legal elements. Those without which the act cannot exist as such, 
or taken on a different configuration. A sale, for example, for a donation or marriage mistaken for a business partnership. Distinct from the object thus understood are its essential qualities, that is, the properties that characterize it in terms of its chemical composition or the evaluation that is generally made of it in trade or society. If the object of a sale is a vase, for example, one of its substantial qualities could be that it is made of gold or silver or that it comes from the art of a fine collector. I, I won't read the last paragraph, but at the, at the last sentence of the last paragraph, he talks about error about the essential qualities of the object in question. For example, if you bought something thinking that it was brass, but really it was gold, or if you sold something and you thought that it was glass, but it was really a valuable jewel. Um, thank you, Mike. So um, Ratzinger misunderstood the nature of resignation. Uh, he thought that he could, again, uh, like a bishop emeritus, he could give up the see to a successor who's going to run that diocese, and in the case of the church, going to run the universal church, and yet he could still remain bishop, or in this case, still remain pope, uh, that he could still participate in pope-ness. That's why he can still give apostolic blessings in his own name, uh, and it's why he can still, uh, why he still lived in the Vatican, wore white and was referred to as his holiness, because in some sense, he still participated in the spiritual gift that was given to him, which he says is irrevocable. Uh, as I pointed out in my opening statement, th this, is, this is problematic, because again, in metaphysics, you've got a cause, the cause causes the effect. So you become a pope, now you're pope, now you belong to everybody. Now he wants to give up running the church actively, but he still wants to belong to everybody, or he still claims to belong to everybody. That that can't happen unless the the uh, efficient cause is still there. Otherwise, the effect doesn't doesn't work anymore. So he has messed up, and and I could I could go on and on about this, but I I, I think the point is is that he has essentially misunderstood what he was doing and and the papacy itself, and therefore it messed up his resignation. And this might, I was just going to bring up maybe so you can, because there is a camp of those who think that Benedict did not validly resign, but he somehow did that on purpose, like 4D chess kind of thing. You're, that's mm -hmm. not your position, no. correct? No, 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 no. no. I, I'm not one of the Chianchi people. Chianchi wrote a book called The Ratzinger Code, and they believe that he deliberately screwed up his own resignation in order to keep uh, a modernist from sitting on the chair. And, and that what's going on is an impeded C and therefore uh, Francis is invalid. Uh, and, and that he gave us hints and codes and, and things. And, and uh, no, that was not my thing. Uh, what was my thing and, and is four years ago when I first started my research into this and when I first appeared on Dr. Taylor Marshall was that it was clear to me from his declaratio that Ratzinger was giving up being the Bishop of Rome. And yet he still claims somehow to participate in, in papalness, right? So my original thesis, the Maza Hypothesis 1.0, was maybe he resigned being Bishop of Rome, but he did not give up being Vicar of Christ. Yeah, I remember uh, that. Um, over time, I mean, I, st I still don't exclude that as a remote. In other words, that he remote. separated the primacy from the See of Rome. That was the hypothesis, if I recall correctly. Yes, it was. Now, in fact, uh, my, the, my other uh, slide, 606. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, so when we read in, in canon law about the Roman pontiff, it obviously the original is in Latin. And you'll notice that it says that it's it's by virtue of the munus that he possesses the power that he possesses, okay? And if we read the English version, it says the bishop of the Roman church in whom continues the office given by the Lord uniquely to Peter, the first apostle, and to be transmitted to his successors. Now, let me stop there. So what you've got is you've got it's the Bishop of Rome who receives the office of the Vicar 
of Christ or the primatial office. Okay. Um, but the Pope is not the Pope because he's the Bishop of, of, of Rome. It's the other way around. Uh, uh, the Bishop of Rome is the Pope because he's the Vicar of Christ, not, not, not the other way around. So there is this sense that if you have not renounced the primatial office, the, the, the Vicar of Christ, you really haven't given up the papacy. Uh, all he did was give up being Bishop of Rome or explicitly that's all he, all he did. Um, I have a quote, if I could find it real quick, from I believe it's by Roberto Di Mattei. And he says, I'm sorry, one more. Let's see if I can find it. No, it's not coming up. But the, the, the main point is that he, uh, you know, he, he's not following the canon law by not renouncing the munis, by not renouncing being vicar of Christ or the primatial office. And speaking of that point of renouncing the munis, maybe we should put up the slide that has canon 332, section two. Um, it, it's slide number two. And then I think it says, so canon 332.2 Latin and English. I don't know if you have that one, Mike. Here it is. There you go. So this is the relevant canon. Uh, so this is the one that comes after the one that we just had on the screen with the purple background. That that one was section one of canon 332. This is section two with the Latin and then the English. The English says, if it happens that the Roman pontiff resigns his office, and in the Latin, as you can see, it's munari, it is required for validity that the resignation is made freely and properly manifested, but not that it is accepted by anyone. And so I assume Dr. Maza's contention is that in order to be properly manifested, one would actually have to use explicitly and specifically the term munus. Is that correct? Uh, no, as a matter of fact, no. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, we could actually sidestep this whole conversation about munus and ministerium and just say this he he clearly gave up being the active bishop of that see the see of rome he clearly did that but he does not clearly give up the primatial office of vicar of christ right the the, the uh this in that sense the successor of saint peter um and i think i did find the uh the quote that i was looking for here okay um, so there was a professor, uh, Monsignor Leonardo Sapienza and Monsignor Oder, uh, who both tell us that Paul VI and John Paul II both prepared, uh, declarations in case they got incapacitated and they couldn't be Pope anymore. And this is the language that they used. Um, quote, uh, I re uh, we renounce our sacred and canonical office, both as Bishop of Rome and as head of the same Holy Catholic Church. So we would not be having this discussion if <laughs> Benedict had issued that declaratio, but he didn't. He didn't follow the example of Paul VI or of John Paul II. Hmm. In, indeed, I would I would say that, that for those that don't know this, or back in the 1960s, Ratzinger and Rahner were uh, thick as thieves, <laughs> and and uh, appropriate term. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they broke up in 19 in in the, in, in the early 1970s, just like the Beatles, <laughs> and um, uh, but uh, they wrote books together uh, even after that. And this is what Karl Rahner had to say. He said, if a collective authority exists within the church, right? Uh, then uh, if, a, if, a, for, if, for example, a presbyterial council could, could, could not, why couldn't a presbyterial council not lead a particular church in principle or 
the bearer of supreme Petrine authority, why can he only be an individual? So in answer to your question, Matt, why does he think that he can say that the chair is empty, but somehow he's still Pope? It's because of this nouvelle theologie from the 60s and 70s, where mm. Rahner is claiming, well, the, the bearer of supreme Petrine authority, who says it has to be an individual? Mm -hmm. I guess one question that comes to mind, if I can be permitted to ask a question, because um, I mean, I don't, obviously I don't consider myself the final authority on this. None of us do. We're not the magisterium. Um, I'm just going off of what the study that I've done, you're going off the study you've done. Um, why do you think it is that not a single cardinal in the College of Cardinals objected to any of this when Benedict pronounced his declaratio and as the weeks followed and eventually gave his last general audience and then the conclave and all of that? I mean, to my knowledge, no, none of the cardinals who participated in the conclave said, you know, what we're doing here is actually not legitimate because the vicar of Christ is still on the chair of Peter. I don't, what, what do you think about that? They're wedded to Vatican II. Even the good ones. And then I guess my another question I have in regard to cardinals, a little different angle. So, I mean, practically speaking, we know, and this could be coming sooner rather than later, we're going to be having another conclave, whether it's valid or invalid, depending on your position, there's going to be one. So what is the position of someone such as yourself who doesn't recognize Francis as the true Pope? Um, how are we going to get a true Pope back? So to, you know, how are we going to have another true Pope? Because Vatican once clearly says that Peter will have perpetual successors. That's the language it uses. How are we going to get back on track as a result of our present circumstances? Uh, well, by the grace of God, uh, God will, will help us out. Uh, let me, let me preface what I'm going to say by saying that uh, there are good authorities who teach us that you can uh, disagree about who the Pope is and you're still a Catholic in good standing. Uh, for example, uh, Fathers uh, Vernes and Vidal, who are considered the, the authority on the code of law from 1917 to 1982, uh, they say they cannot be numbered among the schismatics who refuse to obey the Roman pontiff because they consider his person to be suspect or doubtfully elected on account of rumors uh, in circulation. And um, so I just wanted to get that out of the way. Also, sure. uh, 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 I appreciate you saying that because I think a lot of people would will call you, Dr. Maza, a schismatic for taking the point of view that you have. And that's a very serious accusation. It's, in fact, more serious than um, than if they had called you a sodomite. <laughs> um, so uh, I, I'm glad that you're clearing the air. I think honest men can disagree on this point. Do you gentlemen, do you mind if I start asking you guys just some kind of like some some short fights, some, some rapid can fire you, questions? Before you do that, can you let Ed just answer about how do we get back on track if his theory is correct? And, and, and I was going to ask that anyway, but that, that oh, go okay. ahead. Go ahead. Okay. So, uh, well, now that now that Pope Benedict is, is gone to his eternal reward, uh, when they hold the next conclave, they, they could elect a legitimate successor. If that legitimate successor, if that cardinal that they choose is not a heretic, because a heretic cannot hold office in the church. Unfortunately, the, Francis has stacked the deck. So most likely we will get a heretical pope, in which case he's not a pope at all. But my, I guess my point was that, do you, do you acknowledge that even if a cardinal, like those who are appointed by Francis, who are clearly in the majority, are they valid electors in the next conclave, according to your hypothesis? Well, I, I, again, I'm just going by what the church teaches. And as my, right. my understanding of church teaching is that as long as those individuals are not uh, manifest heretics, they, they could be occult heretics, 
But as long as they are not public heretics, they could participate in the next conclave. Uh, now, how could they be uh, participate in the next conclave if they were chosen by an antipope? Right. And the short answer is that there's something called supplied jurisdiction, where God supplies the jurisdiction that would be lacking in the case of an antipope for the good of the church. Okay. And before you move on to the rapid fire, just one very quick thing, Mike, and I promise I'll be quiet. <laughs> uh, Dr. Maza quoted words, uh, Wurz and Vidal, very renowned canonists. I do quote them in my uh, two, in part two of my article series, and I did want to make uh, a mention of that. So they're, they're mentioned in this book, um, Arnaldo Xavier de Salvereira, sorry if I mispronounced that, he wrote a book, Can a Pope Be a Heretic? And he quotes uh, in regard to uh, peaceful and universal acceptance, he quotes from Worms and Vidal. He says, in respect to a doubtful Pope, it is necessary to make it very clear here that the peaceful acceptance of a Pope by the whole church is, quote, a sign and an infallible effect of a valid election. And that is a quote from Vern, Werns Vidal, uh, their work uh, on canon law, I think tome two, page 520. And he notes in the, in the end note there, the expression infallible effect does not indicate here an effect which infallibly follows from its cause, but it indicates something which if it occurs, can only have been produced by such a cause of which therefore it is beyond a shadow of, of a doubt an effect that is an infallible effect so i just wanted to bring up they do recognize the legitimacy of peaceful and universal acceptance in their work as well but i, I must say though that uh again i stipulate 99 percent of universal peaceful acceptances yeah i'm with it but it, it just doesn't work when the true pope is still alive. In fact, here's a, a, a last thing on universal peaceful acceptance that's kind of strange. Again, Francesco Petruno uh, writes that the fact that some people claim that universal peaceful acceptance is a dogmatic fact actually did not prevent some pontiffs who were historically peacefully and universally accepted as such from being questioned and even going so far as to deny their canonical legitimacy and expunging them from the official list of popes. You know, each year the Vatican puts out the annuario. Mm -hmm. uh, well, if you look at the list of popes before 1940, it's a different list of popes than the one after 1940. Mm -hmm. And this was due to the work of historians and canonists who convinced the Vatican that certain popes that were universally and peacefully accepted were not actually legit popes, and they've changed the annuario accordingly. So that's hmm. troubling for this uh, theory, which is only a theological theory uh, of universal peaceful acceptance. Gentlemen, uh, I have a, just a couple questions for both of you that I think will help clarify some things. And I hope uh, both of you um, don't think that I'm um, pulling for one side or the other on this issue, because I actually think both of you know that I, I actually have a totally different opinion from both of you. So it's to totally fine. Um, let's start with, well, let's start with you, Dr. Maza. Do you think that, um, that Bergoglio is a manifest public heretic? Yes. You do. Do you think that he has been such since before his uh, alleged uh, election? Uh, I can I can document it since after his election, mm -hmm. but I, I strongly suspect that that was the case before the election. Do you hold to the theory that a manifest uh, public heretic automatically loses his office? Absolutely. Okay. So all the all the fathers of the church teach that a churchman loses his office when he's a public manifest heretic. Okay. Suppose, uh, let's do a thought experiment. Suppose that uh, Bergoglio slash Francis uh, were an extremely orthodox pope. Uh, and, and you can define that however you'd like to. Some people in the live chat would define that as a JP2. Others would have <laughs> to go back farther uh, to find someone who is, a, who is a very orthodox conservative by the, by the book Pope. Would you still subscribe to the theory, and in that scenario, uh, that Ratzinger, his his uh, abdication 
slash resignation was invalid? I would, because uh, again, Val, uh, Rat, Ratzinger had strange ideas on the papacy, which affected his resignation. Uh, the fact that Francis is a flaming apostate uh, <laughs> who gives hom homosexual couples blessings uh, and who um, worships uh, demon goddesses from South America and other, <laughs> we could be here all night talking about what he does, <laughs> right? Could. Um, uh, <laughs> the, the fact that he does these things is, is just, uh, it, it's showing that he lacks the grace of the office, but he lacks the yeah. grace of the office because it seems to me and, and to a lot of other people that he, that Benedict did not resign properly and therefore remained Pope despite himself. I, now, I've got to ask this question, and I'm going to try to do so very delicately, Dr. Mazza, because I, to be intellectually honest and also to, you know, kind of throw a bone to a huge portion let me, of... Let me stop you. Let me stop you. I, I no longer beat my wife. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. I, well, it's not a leading question. All right. Okay. It's not a leading question. <laughs> The question would be, okay, if you if you um, if you uh, hold to the to the uh, hypothesis or the theory or or the actually just the church fathers that says that uh, that 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 Francis would not would not be pope because he's a manifest public heretic, why does that not also apply to some of his predecessors whom have done publicly scandalous things like kiss Qurans or subscribe to the Abrahamic? Uh, religion, or also bend the knee towards modernism in various ways. I guess my question would be, couldn't you find fault in some of his predecessors and therefore apply the same logic against them? Well, let me start off with a, a quote from Karl Rahner. And this is Karl Rahner in 1948. All right, so it's not, it's not Karl Rahner in 1973. Uh, even those public heretics and schismatics who either cannot be proved to be or, in fact, are not in heresy uh, through formal sin or subjective guilt are outside the church. Um, in short, even heretics and schismatics in good faith do not belong as members to the visible church. Mm -hmm. Moreover, a bishop or a pope, according to the universal teaching, uh, keeps his ecclesiastical powers, even if he is occultly unbelieving in the purely internal forum, but mm -hmm. possession of ordinary ecclesiastical authority and non-membership in the church are mutually exclusive notions, okay? Um, and if we don't want to believe uh, Rahner on this, uh, we can believe um, Ludwig Ott in the Fundamentals of Catholic Dogma uh, mm -hmm. says the same thing. But your question is, well, couldn't we apply this as the, Sede, as the 1958 Sede Vicantis do to, to all the other popes uh, before, you know, including uh, Ratzinger and before? And yes. the short answer is, is that in order to be a, a public heretic, uh, not only does your heresy have to be public, it's got to be heresy. And the definition of heresy is something that uh, either calls into doubt or directly contradicts a dogma. Now, there are different levels, a de fide dogma. And as, as traditional Catholics know, there are various grades of dogma, of doctrine. OK. Yeah. And so I would defy anybody to give me a de fide dogma that was contradicted by Paul the Sixth, John Paul the Second or Ratzinger. It just didn't happen. Alternatively, now, the, do you believe that Paul the Sixth is in heaven? Do, we, do you believe he's a saint? Uh, I don't believe that canonizations are infallible, especially when they're made by antipopes. OK, uh, to you, Matt, um, thank you for being the instigator behind this. Well, actually I sounds like Dr. Mazo was the real instigator. And then, uh, and then you got, well, anyway, I tapped you to host basically. You did. Thank you for doing this. Okay. So, uh, Matt, do you believe that, um, Francis is Catholic? Uh, I mean, in the, in the legal technical sense, he is a, I mean, as far as I know, he, he was validly baptized. Uh, do, that's... do you believe, do you believe that Joe Biden is Catholic? 
according to the same uh, to the same criteria, he's he's baptized. Um, he's a you, he's a member of the body of the church. Well, I mean, it's clear that he rejects certain. Wasn't Adolf matter. Hitler baptized as well? Yeah, I mean, at some point, obviously, if you renounce um, certain matters of faith and morals, that calls it into question. Um, I don't know how to answer the question better than I mean, I don't think. I, I think that there are points of of Catholic doctrine, even Catholic dogma, that that Francis uh, probably rejects. Um, and I, I addressed this in part two of my I, my two part series. I said, um, I I think it's highly likely, even demonstrable, that he holds multiple heretical views, and that he would show himself pertinacious, meaning obstinate in heresy, if the members of the hierarchy did their duty and pressed him to recant. But yet, if you'll recall, you know, I mentioned Cardinal Burke earlier. After Amoris Laetitia was published in, what was it? I think April of 2006 or 2016, excuse me. And then we had the um, uh, the theological critique that came out that summer by a group of, of theologians and scholars. And then we had the dubia, which was in, I think, November is when it was made public. It was submitted to Pope Francis in September, made public in November. And Cardinal Burke promised, I think, in December of 2016, he was going to do a more than just asking questions. He was going to do a formal correction, which kind of squares with what St. Robert Bellarmine talks about in his discussion of this topic. I have our friend Ryan Grant's edition of On the Roman Pontiff, his translation. And Robert Bellarmine talks about, you know, issuing canonical or not cannot like fraternal correction warnings based on uh, St. Paul's letter to Titus chapter three, where he talks about after the first or second admonition, I forget the exact language, uh, don't have anything to do with a public heretic because he's cut himself off. Mm -hmm. But even, even Bellarmine, who talked about the automatic loss of office due to heresy, did did talk about the need for those uh, fraternal warnings. I forget the exact language he used based on Titus chapter three. Um, so I think if if the hierarchy of Cardinal Burke, for example, issued some kind of a formal correction or others with him, but that's it, that hasn't actually been done yet. That's the is problem. Is that, is, that, is that your red line? In other words, remember when Obama and Syria said, of, well, if they use gas, then that's the red line, and then they crossed it. What, where is your red line? If they start ordaining women, is that the red line? At what point do you say to yourself, this guy's not the guy? Yeah, I'm, I'm certainly ordaining, admitting women to holy orders would be a, certainly be a red line. Um, I mean, there are any number of other things that could be like, um, you know, the whole the whole canard with or the um, the loophole, I guess, they use with fiducia supplicans is that they're blessing individuals or they're blessing couples but they're not blessing unions or however they slice and dice it it's ridiculous there it's as archbishop vigano said uh, he posted a funny meme about fiducia supplicans a couple shortly after it came out it's a picture of a bicycle and he basically says well i'm not blessing the bicycle i'm just blessing the two tires that happen to be attached to the bicycle frame or something you know something like that mm -hmm. um but certainly ordaining ordaining women, you know, saying that homosexual unions are fine, any number of different things. I think Francis holds materially to heresies, but I think in order to be found guilty of that in the public forum, someone would have to stand, like challenge him on that from the hierarchy and say, you can't do that. And actually, in, interestingly, uh, in his treatise on the church, St. Robert Bellarmine lists six reasons quote on account of which councils are celebrated and the fourth reason is suspicion of heresy in the roman pontiff if perhaps it might happen or if he were uh, an incorrigible tyrant this is bellarmine speaking mm -hmm. for then a general council ought to be gathered either to depose the pope if he should be found to be a heretic or certainly to admonish him if he seemed incorrigible in morals and I absolutely think that is what the cardinals and bishops should be doing right now. Isn't that what we're doing as traditionalists, though? I mean, if either in the recognize and resist or whatever various uh, camps that 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 the big tent traditionalism is doing, aren't we acting and judging the pope in a way prior to antecedent to some cardinals getting getting together? 
this is a version of the question I asked you earlier. Right. So I think the best way I can answer is giving a quote from Archbishop Vigano at, towards the end of his address during Dr. Maza's online conference last uh, December. I quote this at the end of uh, part two of my article series. So this is what Archbishop Vigano said. Can we therefore be morally certain that the tenant of Santa Marta, obviously referring to Francis Bergoglio, uh, can we be certain that he is a false prophet per our Lord's words in Matthew chapter seven, which he quoted previous to that? And Vigano says, my answer is yes. What we cannot do because we do not have the authority is to officially declare that Jorge Mario Bergoglio is not Pope. The terrible impasse in which we find ourselves makes any human solution impossible. But, but how is that different? How is that different from blessing the two wheels on the bicycle? He's saying he's the false prophet, but we can't see he say he's not Pope. How can you do that? Well, we can you can say someone is teaching falsely without deposing them based on private judgment. I mean, the issue with us here in this in this uh, live stream is that we're not members of the magisterium, we're not members of the body of bishops or the college of cardinals that's their duty i mean yeah. we can we can recognize errors but it's beyond our pay grade so to speak to say you've lost your office let me ask you one final matt, question matt I, uh, can i interject sure uh, matt again i think you've been listening to bishop schneider too much because that's what he said uh, bishop schneider said quote there is no authority to declare or consider an elected and generally accepted pope as an invalid pope but again, I, I want to quote St. Catherine of Siena, who did declare and consider the generally accepted Pope Clement VII invalid. She said, and she said this to the cardinals, I tell you that you did wrong with the antipope. He was chosen a member of the devil. You have committed all these faults in regard to this devil. You confess him as Pope, which he surely is not. So I agree with you that we were not members of the hierarchy and we can't issue a definitive statement, but wouldn't you agree that we can act like St. Catherine of Siena and call it like it is? I'm willing to go as far as what Archbishop Vigano said in the quote, that he is clearly teaching error. But for me personally, where I'm at right now with my understanding of things, I'm not comfortable in saying Francis is an anti-pope. Okay, final question for you, Matt. Then five minute, uh, five minute, I guess, uh, wrap ups for both of you. Uh, if you were to die shortly after this live stream, God forbid, not on the live stream, and you were to meet your uh, your particular judgment, would you be surprised at all if you were to learn at that moment in time or outside of time that Francis is in fact an anti pope? Um, I mean. Where I'm at with things right now, I think I would be surprised because I just don't, based on what uh, Benedict said, you know, notwithstanding the strange ideas he may have held about the papacy, he said on February 11th, 2013, that, you know, come February 28th of that year, the See of Rome, the See of St. Peter will be vacant and a new conclave will be called to elect a new Supreme Pontiff. I'm paraphrasing a little bit. And that happened, and not a single cardinal elector in the, who participated in the conclave, not a single bishop of the entire church until, if, I believe, four years after the fact, as I said earlier with Bishop Gracida, I think he was the first sometime in 2017, if I recall correctly. None of them objected either to the resignation of Benedict or to the election of Francis. And that's all I have to go on is the public judgment of the church of those who are calling the shots. All That's right. what I would say. Dr. Maza, you be, you opened uh, the, this thing. So we, you got the first word. We're going to give Gaspers the last word. Dr. Maza, five minutes, close us out. Thank you, Matt. Um, I mean, thank you, Mike. So uh, well, I want to thank Matthew and I want to thank you for this wonderful opportunity to just, you know, talk like brothers and, you know, be, be plain speaking sometimes, but it's all in charity, you know, truth and charity. That's what's paramount. Um, look, Peter Seewald, the journalist, the friend of Benedict, asked him, is a slowdown in the ability to perform reason enough to climb down from the chair of Peter? 
And Pope Benedict said, one can, of course, make that accusation. Was that an accusation, guys? That's what he said in his own declaratio, which we read. He's slowing down, and therefore he's going to step down. Why is that an accusation? Uh, in fact, Benedict says to Seewald, it would be a functional misunderstanding. The follower of Peter is not merely bound to a function. The office enters into your very being. In this regard, fulfilling a function is not the only criterion, you know, the only criterion for being a pope. Seewald merely repeated the words of Benedict's own de declaratio back to him, and Benedict calls it an accusation, a functional misunderstanding. Well, yes, anyone, Seewald included, who reads Benedict's declaratio and concludes at face value that by giving up the active duties of a pope, Benedict ceased being papal, has not only misunderstood Benedict's intentions, but the Petrine ministry itself. Quote, the follower of Peter is not merely bound to a function, meaning the administration of the Roman see. Fulfilling a function is not the only criterion for being a pope. Well, what does that mean? That means that Benedict thinks that he could walk away from the function and still be pope, if that's not the only criterion for being a pope. Um, he tells Seewald of, uh, I am a father. You can't simply stop being a father. Stopping is a functionalization and secularization. Um, he says, of course, uh, he is relieved of concrete responsibility, but he remains a father. Um, now, how do we understand this? We have to understand this based on Benedict's past statements. Uh, what he has had to say in the past uh, using that word uh, functional. Uh, for example, Benedict once criticized Martin Luther precisely for misunderstanding the difference between office as jurisdiction or function and office as right or sacrament. Uh, he says, for Luther, the priest does not transcend his role as preacher. The consequent restriction to the word alone had as its logical outcome the pure functionality of the priesthood. It consisted exclusively in a particular activity. If that activity was missing, the ministry itself ceased to exist. So he's criticizing Luther on that. So for we, we can understand Ratzinger then as telling us that just because the activity ceases to exist, it doesn't mean that he's giving up the Petrine Munis, the Petrine ministry. Indeed, uh, Georg Ganswein, his right hand, told us in 2016 that he has not given up the Petrine Munis. Uh, so uh, if, if there, <laughs> canon law clearly says, canon 188, any resignation that is made out of substantial error is invalid by it on its face, by the law itself. Um, we, we have to pray for the church. Uh, Archbishop Vigano has said that before we can have another conclave, there has to be an investigation into the conclave that elected Bergoglio, and there has to be an investigation into Ratzinger's resignation. And also, uh, Monsignor Books, who used to be a close friend of Ratzinger, also said, I think that we need to investigate Ratzinger's resignation to see whether or not it was valid. Uh, and so uh, I, as a layperson, am just following what Monsignor Books suggested and what uh, Archbishop Vigano suggested and the example of St. Catherine of Siena. St. Catherine of Siena, pray for us. Thank you so much, Dr. Maza. Uh, I'm going to reset the clock here, Matt, for you. And I would ask you to uh, sort of conclude us and wrap us out. And then I'll have one comment before we uh, before we end the show. Well, thank you, Ed, for uh, coming on the show today. I'm glad we were able to do this. Um, I think for me, it really does hinge on this um, 
I, I realize it's not a defined dogma, but it is, as I mentioned earlier, the very common opinion, theological opinion about peaceful and universal acceptance. And I would like to review this quote again from Cardinal Below. Um, so he says, finally, whatever you think about the possibility or impossibility of the aforementioned hypothesis of a Pope heretic, at least one point must be considered absolutely incontrovertible and placed firmly above any doubt whatever. The adhesion of the universal church will always in itself be an infallible sign of the legitimacy of a determined pontiff, and therefore also of the existence of all the conditions required for the legitimacy itself. God can permit that at times a vacancy in the apostolic see be prolonged for a long time. He can also permit doubt to arise about the legitimacy of this or that election. He cannot, however, permit that the whole church accept as, po as pontiff he who is not so truly and legitimately. Uh, therefore, from the moment in which the Pope is accepted by the church and united to her as the head of the body, it is no longer permitted to raise doubts about a possible vice of election or a, or a possible lack of any condition whatsoever necessary for legitimacy. And I think that would obviously include, excuse me, the, the supposed invalid um, resignation of Benedict XVI. He says, it is no longer permitted to raise doubts about a possible vice of election or a possible lack of any condition whatsoever necessary for legitimacy. For the aforementioned adhesion of the church heals in the root all fault in the election and proves infallibly the existence of all the required conditions. And that's what it really comes down to for me. As I acknowledge in part two of my article series for CFN, I think there were definitely uh, shenanigans going on with the, you know, the St. Gallen mafia, all of that kind of stuff. But ultimately, if what Cardinal Below says is true, all of that is healed in the root because of universal peaceful acceptance. And it also proves the legitimacy, the validity of Benedict's resignation as well. Uh, I do want to mention, you know, as, as people who are familiar with my work, I obviously don't hold the position I do because I am a fan of Pope Francis. Um, and ultimately, in the end, it will be for the church herself to decide the question, not only of Francis, but of these popes since the council who have led the church into the catastrophic situation in which we find ourselves today. Uh, in practice, however, it is certain that while awaiting an authoritative pronouncement of the church, we must accept them as valid popes in accordance with what the theologians teach, while refusing to follow them if and when they contradict definitive teachings of their predecessors. And as I said earlier, I think it's very likely that Francis is, uh, that he does hold multiple heretical views. I think you can pretty easily demonstrate that. I think the bishops and cardinals should be calling him out on that and issuing formal corrections, warnings, whatever you want to call them, based on Titus chapter 3. Um, but ultimately, as I said, I agree with Archbishop Vigano that while we can call, even go so far as to call Francis a false prophet, we don't have the authority to de definitively or officially declare that he is not the Pope. And may our Lord soon intervene and deliver his church from the scourge of the Francis pontificate and raise up a supreme pontiff after his own heart. And I'll leave it there. Thank you so much, gentlemen, uh, for joining um, the, the, the show. And hopefully you have demonstrated, and I, I think you, you succeeded in this, you have demonstrated that it is possible to deeply disagree on a very important issue uh, and yet remain Catholic brothers. And so um, I appreciate that you both have done that. Dr. Ed Mazza, first time on RTF, Matt Gaspers, many times on RTF. Thank you so much. The only thing I would say for me as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. Uh, the, the answer to this question doesn't much matter to me and how we practice the faith, and I suspect both of you might actually, in the end, um, agree with that. Gentlemen, I'm going to play the outro music. If you want to hang on and debrief off camera afterwards, you're welcome to. If you have to go, that's fine, too. God bless you, and thank you for listening to this podcast.
Thank you.